Welcome to Talent Strategy 60. I am your friendly neighborhood talent strategy nerd, Dr. Jim. And as per usual, I am manning two different platforms on LinkedIn Live and YouTube for the live stream and looking forward to this really great conversation. The topic for today is to is building equity for Black women in leadership. And the purpose of our show in general, as always, is to help talent strategy leaders and talent leaders do more with less by leveraging community intelligence. And that's what we're going to do today, addressing the topic of building leadership brand strength and also building equity for Black women in leadership. So joining us today and, uh, and as always is a fantastic panel of uh, featured guests who are going to share their insights. And uh, before diving into the conversation, I want to get the audience to uh, get to know the uh, the panelists a little bit better. So first up, I uh, want to welcome Sir Therese Grice to the uh, to the show. Sir Therese, welcome. Tell uh, tell everybody a little bit about yourself and the work that you're doing. Hey, yeah. Thanks for having me, Jim. Excited to be here. Um, and also, thank you for bringing me together with some other amazing Black women. Always great to, you know, grow the network. So excited to learn more about them as well, because I, I haven't met uh, Wesley and Whitney before. So anyway, back to me, though. Um, my background is in industrial organizational psychology, which is the science of human behavior in the workplace. Uh, and I am co-owner and chief consulting officer of Mattingly Solutions. We are a woman-owned diversity, equity, and inclusion consulting firm, and we focus on taking a data-driven approach to DEI. Uh, data-driven, yet also human-centric. So when collecting our data, it's about making sure we're hearing the employee voice and using that data to then drive your DEI strategy. Um, and doing all of that work before starting with your behavior change interventions, which is where everybody likes to start, you know, slapping up an unconscious bias training and saying, we did DEI. Um, so that's, that's our whole passion is slowing people down, collecting data, making a plan, and then acting, and then collecting more data to figure out your impact. Um, in addition to, in addition to co-owning my business with my business partner, Victoria Mattingly, we also co-wrote a book that came out in March of last year called Inclusolytics how diversity, equity, and inclusion leaders use data to drive their work. Uh, and super exciting. Uh, yesterday, we actually recorded the audiobook version of that and hope to release that, um, you know, sometime in March at our one year anniversary. So that's fun. Um, and one last thing about us or about me is that I'm also really passionate about allyship and inclusive behaviors. That's why, fun fact, I do not wear makeup, but if you can't tell, I have some on today. Um, we were just reshooting some of our videos for our training course on Ally Up, or sorry, on allyship called Ally Up that is available on Udemy. So yeah, a little bit about me, my passions, and some projects that I have going on. Awesome stuff, Sir Therese. And uh, fun fact uh, for those that are uh, watching the stream, I don't wear makeup either, and maybe I need to start. So there's that. But there is one thing that I want to uh, uh, dig in a little bit further on uh, on something that you described. You, you put this emphasis on data. Um, mm -hmm. Why is it important that we have a data-driven approach to DEIB in general? How does that play into the work that you do? And why do we start there versus you know some other place? Yeah, starting with data is really critical because it helps you know where to focus and when to pivot. Uh, sometimes we get caught up in what the fads are, what other organizations are doing, and we just put that out there and think it's going to solve our issues without figuring out what our issues are. And as I said, we focus on the employee voice because that data matters even more. Instead of assuming what your employees need, just ask them, right? <laughs> But then you have to actually follow through. That's the big piece is not just collecting the data, but being transparent about your data and what you're doing as a result of the data you collected, because that is another difficult thing that happens in organizations is when they say, oh yeah, we have all of this data, but then your employees aren't seeing action. And so that's when we get into the performative space, which I'm sure we'll, we'll get into a little bit more later. I should get off mute. Um, so absolutely appreciate you sharing that. And uh, I'm going to be super looking forward to your insights. And uh, I'm looking at the um, the chat 
in uh, in LinkedIn and it's blowing up and it's going to be pretty active. So I want to just mention this uh, to everybody that's watching the stream. Thank you for joining us. And if you have questions, make sure you drop those in because we'll have these fantastic panelists uh, help answer those questions in the course of the conversation. So next up, I want to introduce Wesleyan Greer to the show. Wesleyan, a veteran of Talent Strategy 60, but on a different topic. So welcome to the show. Nice to see you again. Thanks so much for having me. I'm excited to be here. Um, so again, my name is Wesleyan, and usually I'm on here talking with Dr. Jim, bantering about sales and leadership, but um, today I will be talking about a topic very near and dear to my heart. So I am a recovering chemist, and I moved into sales and then sales leadership. And um, I tell people when I got into sales leadership, I finally figured out what I wanted to be when I grew up because it was everything that I loved. It was just all of the things. And through my journey, uh, being a chemist, going into sales, moving into leadership, many of the times I was the only, I was the only woman of color. I was the only woman. And so all of those things that I learned through my sales career and leadership career, what I've done is at my company, Transform Sales, we have a leadership centric approach to sales training, consulting, and developing. We believe that if leadership is not invested and evolved, then nothing is going to work. So we develop strong leaders in order to develop strong teams. And Dr. Jim very affectionately calls me the Beyonce of sales, which I love it. And so I receive it all the way. Yeah, don't forget the hashtag on that. That's what the kids are doing these days. Um, yes. So Wesleyan, I appreciate you uh, hanging out with us again. I want to follow up on a leadership component that you just mentioned. You focus on making sales leaders more effective. I'd be curious to get your impression and your thoughts uh, when it comes to this particular topic. What is the role that leadership should be taking in advancing Black women into leadership? What's your perspective on that? So the first thing is they all have to realize that there is a problem in the world of sales with hiring Black women at all, right? And so when we look at who we're hiring at an entry level, many times leaders, they have, you know, that similarity bias. They have that, oh, okay, well, this person's never done that. I actually am working with a lady right now, and I am so very proud of her. She's hiring somebody who's seven months pregnant, and she was like, she's the perfect person for the position. But a lot of time in sales, because of the travel, the long hours, all of those things, women aren't hired and then women of color aren't hired because a lot of times we don't know about these opportunities. We don't know how sales can actually change your life. And so when we don't hire women in sales, then we don't really have women to promote, to retain, to mentor, to really help them move up that ladder. And so that's really why there are so few women and so few women of color in leadership because the leaders are not um, really looking outside the box, outside the industry, outside of what they know to find people that have innate sales skills and don't just have a bunch of industry experience. Great stuff, Wesleyan, and I appreciate you sharing that. Um, last but certainly not least, uh, I wanna welcome our third uh, featured panelist to the discussion, Whitney Goins, welcome to the show. Thank you so much, Dr. Jim, and hello, ladies. Very excited to get to know you too. Um, so yes, my name is Whitney Goins. I am a global DEIB manager. I work for a real estate investment trust company. Um, but throughout my career, um, similar to Wesleyan, I kind of bounced around. So I've had um, success in both sales and marketing um, across multiple organizations. But at each of these companies, found myself really going beyond the scope of my role um, in my efforts to amplify the voices of historically historically marginalized groups. Um, so a few years ago, while I was working in marketing innovation, I noticed an opportunity to educate um, our commercial organization, um, which included, you know, marketing, communication, sales on how to approach um, different communications and, and deal with times of communal trauma and horror, which is what we were dealing with around, you know, 2020. Um, so based on what we were seeing, um, essentially took the took the leap of, you know, independently um, working with different firms to educate our commercial organization. And then that led to a few, you know, stretch assignments. And I, eventually I was tapped to join our organization's um, inaugural DEI team. Um, so yeah, that kind of started, sparked my transition into diversity, equity, and inclusion. And I, I love my work. It's definitely um, hard work. So it's, it's, it's lovely to go into an office and into their different organizations and be able to discuss, you know, what we, what we can do better in order to make people feel like they belong. Um, and are treated equitably. Yeah, I love what you said um, 
right there about it's it's hard work and also that it's it's important to you know feel like you're going into an office where everybody else uh is interested in advancing or or improving um it, it, it improving um the trajectory of these issues mm -hmm. so I'd like your input on how you've been able to impact that across your various uh, various roles. You're you're most recently at Molson Coors, and then now you're uh, uh, you're soon to be in a in a new organization. But uh, give us give us a little bit of a window into where you start in advancing these issues forward. Yeah, and I think I mean, granted, it, it may vary for for different individuals. And it's so funny after when I was leaving my um, previous organization and you know it was it was my decision and really just based on my desire to relocate and i had formed such a great relationship with my manager to the point where i even told him i was like man i, I really hope i don't like my next manager as much as you because i find myself working like twice as hard just because you know i you know just adored him as a manager um and so you know studies have also shown that when people feel like they belong and people feel like they are treated equitably, they are actually going to put in the work. They're going to do more um, and they're going to be more productive. So when we think about what it takes and what really what it takes to get more of a sense of belonging um, for people coming from historically marginalized groups or just underrepresented groups in, in corporate um, America or these different spaces, it really goes down to, you know, everyone benefits when when people feel like they are treated um treated well so um yeah and I, I like i said i feel like individually that that may vary as far as what people may need in order to feel that but i mean the, the studies and the data does not does not lie when it comes to productivity yeah so i uh, i appreciate that perspective and you you hit on something that's really interesting to me and it was the phrase what people what each individual needs and it's mm -hmm. a it's a great um sort of table setter for the rest of this conversation. And, and I want to frame it this way. So I, you know, obviously everybody that's interacted with me at some level knows that I like talking to all sorts of people about all sorts of different things. And when we, when we're looking at issues of diversity, affirmative action, DEIB and whatnot, I'll often ask people um, that I'm engaged in conversation with, who does this most often benefit? Who do these initiatives off most often benefit? And I'm surprised at some of the answers that I get because almost automatically it points to, well, these are just, uh, you know, quota requirements, check the box requirements that uh, impact a very small segment of the overall population. And more often than not, a lot of people will, without really thinking much about it, say this, this largely benefits the African-American community. And being in the space, I know that that's not true. I mean, when you look at the largest beneficiaries of affirmative action and DEIB initiatives, it's it's largely been uh, white women who have benefited benefited the most from these initiatives. And I don't say that from a, from a place of animosity or anything, it's just what the data shows. And the reason why I call that out is that there's another interesting component of the dynamic that we're looking at. Wesleyan, you mentioned that, you know, hey, it's important to have representation. And I think each of you will be saying elements of representation so that people can move their careers and progress their careers. But when you look at the Fortune 500, it's the Fortune 500 recently set a record for having the most women CEOs in their history. And that number was at 43. And when you look at how many black women were occupying the C-suite, there were three. And for me, that was, those are two really interesting data points where when you look at it from the context of global populations, there's only 43 women that are quali qualified to lead these multinational organizations. And there's only three in a in the entire world who are African-American or black women who are leading organizations. That's a problem. And when I have that conversation with, with folks, they don't seem to really connect why that's a problem. So one of the one of the things that I'd be curious to get your input on is why are people either unaware or unconcerned about how those numbers shake out? Like it is a big problem if only three black women are leading some of the most powerful organizations in the world. That doesn't make sense to me. So I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna have uh, 
Whitney lead off with that one. Uh, I, I just voluntold you for your feedback. So uh, I'm, I'm curious when it comes to why are people either unconcerned or is it is it an unconcerned issue or is it an unaware issue? Yeah, and it's I think what's even more shocking about that um, point when we when we look at black women, considering studies have come out that have shown black women are among the most educated group in the United States. Right. So it's like, how are we not qualified? Right. Um, but I, I will say from my years of working in diversity, equity and inclusion, a lot of times it's approached as like the zero sum game, right? Where if I'm winning or if one group is is the the focal point for at one point, then another group is is not being considered, right? So I think a lot of times when we when we think about why perhaps black women or this this data point isn't as alarming for other people, um, I think there's been a lot of you know, what about me ism, right? Over the last, um, over the last few years. So it, it is that that's a tough one, Dr. Jim, I'm trying to I'm going back and forth um, about why more people aren't concerned. Um, but at, at the end of the day, we also have to make sure that you know, black women aren't getting burnt out from fighting for themselves too, because we do need allyship in that, um, in that journey and that fight and bringing awareness to what's what's actually happening. So yeah, I'm kind of going back and forth about, you know, why, because I feel like that's systemic, right? It's It's been happening for so many years. Um, I've never actually sat back and asked the question, man, why does no one, why, why is no one fighting for us? Or why, why does no one care? It's like, it's just how it's been, right? So I'm interested to hear what the other ladies have to say on that one. Yeah, I yeah. mean, some of these things are unanswerable. So I, it's 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 kind of rhetorical in 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 a large sense. But I think uh, your position, Whitney, is echoed by a lot of people. I I think the same thing, even though I'm not directly impacted by your circumstances. Mm -hmm. It's still an important question to ask. So Teresa, I, I cut you off. Sorry about that. No, you're fine. I was just like eager to jump in because my my immediate thought, just based on my experience and what I've seen in this space is this uh from the overrepresented group their feelings are it's not my problem right mm -hmm. and not and they don't even mean that necessarily in a in a bad way like they're not coming out here to be you know hateful and say that's that's not my problem it's more of uh more often than not just kind of a loop well that's not me right that's black women i'm not a black woman so i'm not paying attention to that you know in I, I do say a lot of times when you br start to bring it to their attention, all of a sudden there's, oh, okay, I didn't realize, you know, until you told me there were only three. Now I am curious, like, how does that happen? Is it a qual And then they think, well, is it, there's a cognitive dissonance, right? Because they're like, well, all of these people are qualified. That's how they would get into that CEO role. So does it mean that these black women just aren't? Well, that doesn't feel right. I know intelligent black women. So, but everything's equal, you know? And so once they do have to sit down and start thinking about it, and there's that issue of, it doesn't make sense, right? Something's wrong here. They don't know how to fix it. And to your point, Whitney, of this zero, this fear of this zero sum. If I was, if I were to stop and focus on this and try and make opportunities for black women, well, that means now I'm giving up my access to power and resources. So now I can't move forward. Is that something that I really wanna sit with and think about and resolve? Or do I want to continue to just, you know, move on and pretend that everything's fine and we're all equal and everyone has fair chances and no one's being like experiencing these inequities. So all of this to say, I, I think that not my problem comes to the, the heart of why people are both unaware and unconcerned. It's a it's a really good point. I, I like the not my problem um, perspective that you brought forward, Sir Trees. Um, I want to latch onto that and, and bring it to Wesleyan and and tie it together with another thing that I've heard um, just in this opening part. And it's this whole idea of qualifications. Like when I hear qualifications, it bothers me because it immediately makes me think that this is something that people can hide behind. Mm -hmm. So when you pair the not my problem and the qualifications component of how some some of these things are evaluated, you know, for me, 
it looks like cover. I don't know how that's tied into your experience, Wesleyan, being in the sales function, but I'd like you to share a little bit about your perspective on why this problem exists. And is this a function of una being unaware or unconcerned or something deeper than that? So I always look at things from a leadership lens. <clears throat> and so many times what I think about when we have less representation in senior leadership, I think about, okay, so who do we have in senior leadership, right? So we have 43, um, I think you said 43 women in total out of 500, right? But we only have three that are black women. So when we think about the 43 women, how did they get to where they are today? They had mentors, they had allies, they had people who helped bring them along, who helped teach them what to say, how to do it, how to promote themselves internally, how to you know really have that committee, that board of directors, the people in the room when they weren't there. And so what happens so often, black women don't know how to do that. Like nobody teaches us how to promote ourselves. They say, put your head down, go work, go get all these degrees, go get more certifications, go do this, go do that. Volunteer on this committee. Nope, nope. Do this more, do this more, do that more. And we get burned out. And we're like, when is this going to end? Like, I'm so tired of doing all of these things and I'm still not getting promoted. And nobody's taking us aside and saying, Yes, I know you're doing these things, but you're not self-promoting. You're not going and talking to the board of directors. You're not offering to present in front of a group. Like those things are not something that we are taught to do. And since we don't know how to do it, we burn out and then we leave the company. And then what happens when you leave the company? You make a lateral move and you keep making these lateral moves. And to move up the ladder, you never have that opportunity because you keep that cycle of burnout. You keep that cycle of doing and reaching and striving. That's, oh man, you mentioned so many things there and especially the concept of, hey, who are the models within your organization that you can you, you can pattern your career path to, but also who's gonna actually step out and give you sort of a behind the scenes look of what, what you need to do to, uh, to move forward. I think that's, that's consistent with, uh, with a lot of underrepresented communities. So that really great points there, uh, Wesleyan. I think, um, I think one of the things that that I want to shift the conversation to is is really getting at the data and the the, the landscape from uh, from a data perspective and what what that data tells us. Mm -hmm. So when we're looking at advancing women into uh, black women into leadership, or uh, yeah, when we're looking at uh, advancing black women into leadership, what are some of the blockers from a data perspective that exists and how should those things be removed or done differently so that we can create more space for black women to step into leadership? Uh, I'm going to have Sir Therese uh, tackle that uh, really simple question. <laughs> simple. Uh, well, I'll take it, though, because, you know, data is my passion and I love talking data. Um, one, one thing I always start with when it comes to questions like this is, stop looking at just broad data, right? Looking at overall, this is what's happening or this is what you're seeing everywhere else and look in your own backyard. Um, because until you look at your own data and see what's happening, you're not getting a full picture. So that's my, that's my number one piece of advice is if you really wanna support the black women in your organization, let's start looking at the data in your organization related to black women. And there's a like, plethora of data, different types of data you can be looking at and should be looking at. And it depends on what your purpose is. So what's your why? What are you trying to drive? And then that's going to help you with what you look at. And I won't give you a whole data lesson, but I'm just going to give you a little bit here um, to say, you know, if you're thinking diversity, that's at the base level, that's just representation. So first of all, figuring out, you know, okay, we have three black CEOs, you know, broadly. So how many, how many black women do you have in your organization compared to other identities? Simple diversity. When you start to bring in equity, that's when you break it down by different policies and systems. So who's being promoted? How many black women do you have in your high po pool, your high potential, right? Um, in, in how many of your black women are, you know, in your professional development programs or going to conferences or whatever that is, seeing that in comparison to other identity groups is really going to help. And then uh, on, on the next piece is inclusion. Inclusion are behaviors, it's what you do. Uh, so looking around and seeing, you know, at, it, this is when we ask other, we ask your black women, how are other people treating you and getting their input 
because that'll help you know if they're experiencing inclusive behaviors from others. And if not, you can see what you need to teach other people, right, about how they should be treating them. And then the last piece is the feelings of belonging, that's self-report. So asking your black women, whether in a survey or in focus groups to get some qualitative data, how's it going, you know? You feeling valued, respected, seen, heard? <laughs> and, and then going one step further and saying, well, what can we do to get you there? Mm -hmm. And the key there is what can you do, right? Because that's something else that happens a lot with black women is we're asked to solve the world's issues. And I saw this come up a little bit in the comments too. So I know we all feel it and know what's happening. We are asked, okay, how, what do you need, right? And I just told you to do this. I do think it's value, nothing about us without us. We, you need to have that input, but you then can't make them solve the issue themselves, right? <laughs> you, you ask them what they need and then you have to put in the work, the time, the resources to help them be able to, to elevate and move forward. So. That's, that's my biggest piece. And I, I've been going for a while. I could add, I could add more. I could talk about this for days, but collecting your own data and then actually acting on it based on your specific needs from your specific, um, your specific, uh, black women employees. So great stuff, Sir Therese. And I know that with all of that mention of data, my co-host uh, LB, who's managing the uh, the, the comments, is going to be uh, really getting super excited because he's full out in his data analysis phase on the doctoral research that he's doing, which is actually on women in leadership. So uh, shout out to you for you know a, a, a giving giving him a, a big smile because of all the data talk. I want to bring it to a practical level and hand it off to Whitney, um, and, and not that. Sir Therese, what you said wasn't practical, but I, I, I'd like a, a good understanding, Whitney, um, from, you know, sort of an in the trenches perspective, because you've worked at a couple of organizations that had really strong DEI practices. How did you actually take the data and the feedback that the organization was telling you and put that into action to elevate uh, women in general, but black women in particular uh, into positions of leadership? Share with us a little bit more about some of the practical ways that that can be done within an organization, building off of what Sir Therese already said. Yeah, and I, I feel like so you can have this strong what you think is a you know bulletproof DEI plan, right? But it's like that game of telephone, like at the top leadership level, it's like oh yeah, we're all for it, we're so excited about this plan. But then somewhere the message gets lost in in mid management, and that's honestly where a lot of people are suffering silently when it comes to microaggressions and having to deal with um, their direct managers, right? So it has been interesting to, to implement these, these programs. And I absolutely love what Sir Tree said. A lot of times in order to make that um, strategic plan or those initiatives um, a bit more bulletproof, sometimes you just need that data, like really relying on the data, but not focusing, um, you know, not solely on qualitative data. So not just focus groups and understanding, um, you know, how people are, you know, understanding sentiments, which are great, um, but also that that quantitative data. So even as far as, and, and sometimes it just takes kind of sitting back and reflecting and understanding the root of the problem. So for instance, when we think about, um, let's say as a black woman, maybe my issue is, you know, I am not being promoted. I feel like my work, I'm not being seen for everything that I'm being to uh, bring to the organization. Yet I have colleagues who are thriving in mediocrity, essentially, and are, you know, climbing their way up the ladder. What's the issue? Um, so is it feedback? Is Whitney receiving the proper feedback, right? Um, so one thing that we've actually talked about is pulling um, performance reviews and actually looking at the word count. So is Whitney, what, what's the work? How, how much are you actually writing in, in, in Whitney's feedback? Um, like, is it just the, oh, Whitney did a great job, but you're, you're rating her as developing versus you're giving, you know, her colleagues these rave reviews, paragraphs long. Um, and so then it goes back to, okay, is the problem um, within our leadership, are our managers not comfortable giving feedback to professionals of color or to black women? Um, what, what's the, What's the issue there? So there's there's so many um, layers there in, in assessing what's what needs to happen in each organization, right? Like even when we talk about pay equity, for instance, um, my current organization, we actually do very well when it comes to pay equity, where professionals of color um, are actually, you know, 
slightly overpaid, um, right? So where other organizations struggle with uh, professionals of color and um, when it comes to a pay gap in gender um, or gender pay equity. So we're thriving there, but then it goes back to, okay, but what about representation? Where are these professionals of color and how can we get them in? So assessing what needs to happen in your organization really starts um, with the data and understanding those layers. And then for more of that qualitative data, accessing your employee resource groups, but going back to, again, what I think the three of us have all said is, is the burnout, right? So now you're putting extra meeting and time on my calendars to ask me how I'm feeling, to ask what you can do. And I still have another full-time job to manage. Um, so just being mindful of how much we're tapping people for that that qualitative um, qualitative reassurance and, and input on what we can do do better as a company. There's there's a lot there. And I, I'm going to go, the, the comments on the live stream are fantastic. And there's a couple things that I want to pull into this discussion. Um, that's a little bit, it's related, but it's slightly um, in a different lane that we were, what we were planning on, on going. One of the points that, uh, that were, was made in the chat uh, and this is brought out by Vicky. She mentioned, okay, you have the data. Now, what are you going to do with it? Um, so that is an important question. And I think I'm, uh, uh, so that's one question. But the other thing that, uh, that I noticed that was really interesting, and Brian Poindexter brought this out in the chat, is that there's a trend where leadership is taking the data and evaluating it, but taking it personally and feeling attacked by it. So those are big problems in terms of advancing any initiative. But if you're if you're just doing the data analysis and not moving it forward, that's a problem. But it's a bigger problem if you're taking the data, it tells you what it tells you, and then you take it personally. So my question to the panel, and I don't know if anybody wants to volunteer in taking this because it's a little bit of a wild card. How do you get over both of those blockers or obstacles? The data is there, but you don't put it in action. The data has been analyzed and you take it personally and you don't put it into action. What's what's a way to get around that? How do you build that capability or capacity to move forward from there? Anybody um, want to volunteer that one? Oh, Wesley? Yeah, I can comment on that um, because as I was listening, I was uh, one of my favorite quotes was popping up in my brain, which is initiatives go to die in middle management. Mm -hmm. And so one of the things that happens is, you know, executives sit up in their ivory tower. They see all this data. They, they're like, oh, my gosh, it's so alarming. And then they're like, OK, frontline managers, go fix the problems. Go fix it. Just go do it. Nobody's training them. Nobody's teaching them. Nobody's telling them how to fix a problem. Nobody's giving them a roadmap. And a lot of times what I like to when we're working with leaders, I'm like facts over feelings. OK, so what are the facts? Let's figure out what is being said. What is the impact of what is being said? Now, what do we need to do? And so literally taking it and moving it into a very granular fashion like that, like this is what the data says. This is how it's impacting the organization. For instance, if we're looking at data and we're like, oh, okay, yeah, we're doing pretty good with our with the black women that we have, but oh, in sales and in engineering, we have only 3%. I wonder why. OK, so let's drill down into that. Let's not take it personally. Let's not blame the leaders for not hiring or not being inclusive or using the wrong practices or forcing people out. But how can we take what we know? How can we use that and how can we get better? And so not always being offended, not always taking things personally, because that's what's holding organizations back. They meet and they meet and they meet and they meet and nothing happens. And so unless we take actions on the data, unless we actually have a roadmap, then nothing will ever change. I think uh, based on some of the responses that we're getting in the uh, in the comments, uh, Wesleyan, I think you have uh, another hashtag on the way, and that's facts over feelings. So uh, you're going to have like 15 hashtags coming out of this conversation. Uh, Sertrice, uh, same question uh, to you. What's your take on it? And this is especially this is where you help organizations too. You're doing the analysis and helping them move that forward. So this is uh, I'll be interested to get your thoughts. Yeah, so I want to build on what you were just saying, Wesleyan, and to the point of you have to remember that it's not about you, right? When it, for any human, whenever anything happens and you feel like you're getting feedback, you start to get defensive. You, it's just our gut reaction because we naturally want to believe we are good people. And if we're good people, we can't do anything wrong. And if we're overseeing this company, like, no, we're doing a great job, right? So it, all of those things start to crop up and your immediate response is, well, that has to be wrong. 
that is your immediate natural instinct. But we can't live our lives by instinct. And for some reason, we forget that in the in the workplace. <laughs> and we go and we into these, um, you know, we go into our id and we just let it drive us. And you forget about the people that you claimed you wanted to help in the first place. So if you collected this data, at some point, you said you wanted to help your underrepresented group. That was your goal. So you need to remember to center those groups. If you've heard that term, that's what it comes back to. So before I always tell people, you know, if you're not ready to actually act on data, don't collect it. I sit here and preach all day about the importance of data and how that can help you. But don't go out there making commitments and promises if you aren't ready to push that forward. And before making those commitments and promises, let's get some training done on interpersonal skills. And that includes things like empathy and centering. And so if you have those skills based in you, you are still going to have those gut reactions when things come up that aren't going well, because none of us like hearing bad news. And, but once you hear that bad news, if it starts to happen, try and self-reflect and realize, ooh, am I getting defensive? Do I need to recenter my Black women in this scenario, you know, and make sure that, that I'm focused less on, maybe I did screw up, maybe I didn't, maybe it was someone else, whoever it is, there's data here telling me there's an issue, what can we do to fix it, and I need to put my feelings to the side. Other part of that, though, to the point of I know allyship has come up a couple of times, you need to be comfortable and build a, a space where your black women or other leaders can step up and be like, hey, I feel like you're taking this a little personal and you need to remember it's not about you. Mm -hmm. And when they say that, not get more defensive, but here and be like, oh, snap, you know what? You're right. I was I was slipping back into that default. Let's let's refocus the conversation. So that, that's my main thought there on on how you're handling people who um, who get defensive when this is coming up. And then in regards to, you know, we, you have the data now, what that you need to do the actions that come up, but I will say specific things, you know, if, if you look at the data and you realize you're not getting people in, okay, start looking at where are you recruiting from? Where, how are you selecting? What's your processes? Are you doing blind interviews or, um, you know, if there is a pipeline issue, are you doing something to develop a pipeline? partner with people or other organizations who are doing that work so you can try and get more people in. There's a lot there. Internally focused though, creating um, space for sponsorship because women in general are over mentored and under sponsored. That means there aren't enough people who are putting themselves on the line and saying, hey, you know, I support Whitney. I think that she can do a really great job. You need to give her this opportunity. And so if you're seeing that your black women aren't moving up, but they have the capabilities, let's let's try and open doors for them. But those are a few things that came to mind um, through this conversation. Whitney, I know you wanted to add some things too. I'm pass it to you. Yeah, I mean, I think one way that we kind of tackled, um, well, or attempt to tackle the, you know, it's not about you syndrome is um, more so empathy training. Um, and I prefer, honestly, empathy training over diversity training, because I'm not sure if you can necessarily mm -hmm. teach diversity, but teaching people, um, you know, why it's important, right? So when it came to empathy training, actually walking people through um, the different experiences and perspectives um, of their colleagues of different backgrounds, right? Um, so as one example, when it comes to um, why empathy is so important, and then also holding people accountable, um, I think it's important to tie um, those initiatives to the goals of your leaders. I like to, to tell people, oh, you, you need to do this or you need to increase your representation, but they're not held accountable. It's like, oh, OK, whatever. Of course, like a leader isn't they're like as long as my check is still coming in and my bonus still looks good, then, of course, it's not a priority. But I always recommend tacking it on to um, to be a part of their yearly goals where it does affect um, their their compensation and you know other other um, incentives right so for instance one thing that we've um, done at you know multiple organizations that I've worked at um, is actually require that uh, when we're interviewing for candidates that at least fifty percent of those candidates have to be professionals of color and then understanding that okay once we select those candidates that we are still looking at the data to see who you hired and if you're still only hiring a certain type of person or um, if, we, if we're bringing you all of these qualified pro professionals of color and your last three hires were still all white men, 
we're coming to you. We're asking you a question. Like when you get that meeting invite from from Whitney, just know that that's what we're talking about. So to understand and really just put people on the people on the spot as well, because that whole you know it's not my problem. People have a tend to take a very different perspective when you're calling them out on their BS, right? So to put to put it quite frankly, no one wants to talk about it until you know you're you're putting that time on their calendar and actually discussing and you know asking them you know walk me through your um, through your concerns, what's happening? And I will say inevitably sometimes people will give you the feedback of oh well you know this person was just more ready they have the industry experience is more of that that term that we hear a lot plug and play right but that goes back to addressing um the 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 system the system of racism and um, oppression right so yes of course they have industry experience but look at the industry that has not been diverse right so the, the industry has lacked in representation so of course if you're just pulling people from the industry, it's going to be just lateral moves and shifting of white men, right? So understanding when do we need to step in? How do we hold people accountable? Because yeah, sometimes just asking or telling, um, volunteering someone to, or a leader to hire more diverse representation, you're not holding them to anything. I, uh, there's a lot in what both, uh, you, and, uh, Whitney and, uh, and Sir Therese have said that, that I really would like to expand. I mean, I, I, I love the, uh, the, the point that Sir Therese made about, um, black women are, uh, over mentored and under, under sponsored. That's like an exact quote that Lawrence, uh, often says, and that's a problem amongst underrepresented communities in general. Mm -hmm. Um, and I'm painting with a broad brush here, but you know, from my experience, I've brought, I've been brought up in the keep your head down and your mouth shut sort of environment. So I would imagine a lot of other people in underrepresented communities have been raised up in that environment too. So it's tough to, you know, kind of take that self-advocacy component of it. But Whitney, what I really like about what you just talked about, and there was a lot there, is tying in this answer is one of the one of the comments that came up in the chat, is tying executive or leadership um uh tying their performance to how they're moving these initiatives forward. How do you mm -hmm. hold leadership accountable? You got to write that stuff down and make them accountable at the end of it versus um, what what's often in the world of work is that this is all of these sort of things are seen as nice to haves. And we're seeing it now that as soon as the economic situation shifts a little bit, all of these initiatives that are designed to uplift broad elements of the population kind of get back burnered because, well, it's not, it, it's not economically expedient. So really great stuff. Um, I want to advance this, uh, uh, and take it to another, uh, or advance the conversation. Uh, and there's so many great comments in the, in the chat too, that, uh, it's, we should have a two hour session. Um, but, one of the things that I'm, I, I'm, I'm really curious about, and I want to lead with, uh, with Wesleyan on this. When we're talk, when we're looking at the specific challenges that Black women face, when it comes to advancement in general, but advancement into leadership in particular, what are the things that people are either unaware of, and what can be done to move those things out of the way? What can what can somebody like me, or anybody in leadership, do to be intentional about elevating? Uh, black women in the leadership path. What's your take on that? Um, so kind of going on to what Lawrence mentioned is the, the lack of sponsorship. So if this is something that you really have a passion for, so even for me, I'm, I'm a sales trainer, I'm a corporate sales trainer. There are probably like five black women corporate sales trainers. And I am so fortunate to have sponsorship, if you will, um, by people who see me, know what I do, and they say, hey, here's a fantastic person. You don't need me this time. How about you hire Wesleyan? So literally by offering your hand and putting your neck out on the line to say, hey, I know this person does a fantastic job. Why not offer them this instead of me? So what that does, going to Whitney's um, point of teaching empathy, it's like, how do I empathize with somebody? How do I put myself in their shoes? How do I remember when I didn't have that voice, when I didn't have that sponsorship, when I didn't know anything? That's what we have to do and really think about each Black woman as an individual. Because there may be a person on your team that wants to rise to the highest rank. And so your job is to help her rise to those ranks. 
There could be somebody who just loves that position that they're in and that is what they want to do, but they don't want to have all of the crazy BS and all of the stress around them. So really seeing a person as a human, really seeing that woman for what she is and what she wants and what she desires and helping her, holding her hand, taking her along and giving her a voice. The biggest thing that you can do to elevate women into leadership is giving them a voice at the table. They don't have a voice. Sometimes they don't even know how to find their voice. And then the final thing is, as women, black women, white women, I'll do this universally. We have trauma. We have stuff that we have dealt with in our background that a lot of time we bring to work and we don't even realize we're bringing it to work. And so what it takes for us, sometimes the onus is on us for us to say, you know what? I always feel offended every time X, Y, Z happens to me. Maybe I need to do a little work on myself so that I can show up as my best self and I can have, I can attract the kind of people around me to help me get to the next level. So mm -hmm. those are my few little points on that. Dr. No, Jim, can I add something on that too? Because I think, and we keep coming back to sponsorship, which is, is so vital when it comes to making sure that um, underrepresented communities are getting those opportunities. But you also touch on such an amazing point as far as like making sure that our sponsors are also moving with empathy, right? So understanding that women are less likely to go for roles if they don't meet 90% of the qualifications and encouraging a, a woman to go ahead and apply for that promotion. Um, knowing what it, it feels like to be black in corporate America and understanding how, you know, I might need that extra push or to look at things from a different standpoint. Because also when you think about Sponsors, let's say I, you know, forge a great relationship with a an older white male at my organization and I ask him to be my sponsor or mentor. Right. Um, and so he thinks that he's doing me a favor by, you know, giving me advice and things like that. But sometimes the advice can also be tone deaf because, no, I can't say what you know, I can't speak up in a meeting and say that because then I'm the angry black woman or then I'm an aggressor. Um, versus, you know, so we know the different perceptions that men and women have in the workplace, but then also adding that layer of race on as well. So making sure that if you are um, looking to be a sponsor or a mentor to someone, just making sure that you're aware of the fights, the multiple fights and layers of that, those battles that they're up against. You know, what you just mentioned actually rang a really strong bell to something that you mentioned earlier that maybe maybe the foundation for advancing all of these is that everybody needs to just have more empathy training because I don't think a lot of people are even aware of the fact how you know why underrepresented communities in general and women in particular and black women uh, as a subset of that are hesitant to kind of quote unquote be too loud because we don't want to be seen we, uh, there, there, we, you don't want that perception about you because that can be extremely damaging. So I think, uh, I think that empathy training might be something that should be a core requirement of, uh, of leadership. Uh, so Therese, I want you to, uh, uh, have the chance to add on to anything that was already said in terms of, um, what people are unaware of, what could they can do to kind of advance black women in their leadership. What are your, some of your suggestions that you feel would be useful? Yeah, I just want to build on um, what's been previously said a little bit, and I'll be quick um, because y'all kind of covered a lot of what I had in mind, but um, I really just want to harp on the fact of we, like Black women, we're not a monolith, right? We are not all the same. We don't have all the same needs. And so that comment about remembering the individual, that's how all of allyship should work. It's not that you support, you know, Black women as a whole. It's no, I support Whitney. I support Wesleyan, right? That's that's what you're doing. And that's about building relationships. So you have to get to know someone and figure out what their needs are. So if you are a specific leader and you're saying, how can I support my black women? Go take them out to coffee, right? To have some time, get to know them, figure out where they're at, figure out what their goals even are, because maybe they don't want to move up. Maybe they're happy and you're about, you're out here and you're going to start throwing things at them. And they're like, whoa, whoa, I didn't ask for all that extra work on my plate, you know, versus maybe they do want that. So building that relationship finding out their long-term goals, and then helping them plan on how to get there. Um, is it that they need more education? Get them those educational opportunities. Is it that they simply need exposure? Get them in the right room and make sure that they're able to then move forward. So I, I love that and just wanted to kind of harp on that a little bit more. Um, and then in regards to the empathy piece, 
I, I like to throw this out there, especially for those people, again, who get defensive or who are like, I don't, why are we talking about black women again, right? Um, is at the core of DEI, it is about being a good person, right? We want to respect people because a lot of times they say that too. They're like, well, I respect everyone. And it's like, you, okay, exactly. That's what I'm asking you to do. But you also have your black women telling you that right now they don't feel respected. So what are some behaviors we can change to get us there? And so kind of framing the conversation that way can help get people on board who aren't there. Um, and then one other thing, if y'all haven't heard this before that I really love that um, came to mind when you were talking about empathy is, you know, we've all heard the golden rule, but there's also the platinum rule, which is instead of, uh, which is treat others as they'd like to be treated, right? And so again, just tying all of that together, the empathy and the getting to know indiv individuals, it treat them as they want to be treated. If they, if they tell you that they are having issues, listen to that and make some changes. That's the best way to lead. It's, it's communication is what it comes down to build, building those strong relationships. Awesome stuff. Um, there's been so much said in this conversation that I wish we had more time to kind of dig in deeper um, because it's it's not a conversation that lends itself up, to, lends itself to easy solutions. So I look at this as kind of a starting point because it's not something that is typically talked about. Uh, there's a lot of things that are typically talked about. And that's a problem, but this is, this is separate from that. Um, so I want to get uh, everybody's take on one or two key action items that the folks that are going to be watching this on the stream and in and, and the recording, what are one or two things that they can do within their organizations to more effectively advocate for Black women moving into leadership or advancing in general? Uh, I want to open that. Uh, I'll, I'll have Whitney lead off with that and then uh, get, uh, get the rest of the panel. Sorry, my... Um, I guess connection started to skip a little bit. Um, so you said just key takeaway action items? Yeah, one or two key action items that people can um, start implementing in their places of work to be more effective in advancing Black women into leadership. Absolutely. Um, and it this conversation really reminded me of a quote um, that basically talks about, you know, until Black women are free, none of us will be free, right? So talking about, you know, what the systemic oppression that has been put into place and what that means for, for Black women and being, dealing with one being Black, but then also being a woman. And so the idea that until we are free, um, the, the systems of oppression and, and layers that we're essentially fighting to get from underneath, um, you know, how it affects the the rest of the world and the rest of the country. Um, but when we think about, you know, what we've discussed today, I just think about going back to, and again, I'm I'm big on empathy. That's um, really, when I think about my DEI career, it's been based off of training people on how to be empathetic and even the difference between empathy versus sympathy. Um, and, you know, empathy, putting your, really putting yourself in, in that person's shoes and acting on their behalf versus, you know, um, sympathy is, is more so, man, that really stinks. But, you know, I'm I'm here when you get out that hole. Yeah, like I'll be over here waiting for you. Um, so I would say one moving forward, um, I think Sir Teresa did a great job but as far as saying we should address people as individuals, understanding that. Um, and really, that's why representation is so important. Right. I may be in a room and you expect me to speak for all black women. But as we talked about earlier and someone turned into a hashtag, we are not a monolith, right? So my experience will be very different um, from someone else's experience. Um, actually, it's a funny story. Um, someone actually re reached out, uh, a friend of mine reached out today. She leads a Black ERG at her organization. Um, and one of her, one of the members um, of the ERG who is um, a white male ally, was very excited and thought that he was doing such a great thing by, you know, everyone that he came in contact today, essentially asking of them, you know, do you identify as black so that he could tell them Black History Month. And so it's this, like going back to we are not a monolith, right? Someone may be very, someone may appreciate that while others are like, that is the most tone deaf thing I've ever heard. Right. So understanding that people will take things very differently um, based off their previous experiences. Um, so I'd say walking away those those action items is um, empathy. And then, you know, what does the data tell you? And I think the data also does a great job of those people who are more 
strict on how can we move the business forward. Like you, you can't deny the numbers, right? So making sure that once you have the data in place that, okay, now what are the actions behind it and tying it to those um, leadership incentives? I think going back to something that you said earlier is that not only, you know, leveraging the data and building action items, there should be an accountability component that comes after that too, so that it actually moves forward. So great stuff, uh, Whitney. Wesleyan, uh, I want your take on uh, on what are the things that, uh, that you feel organizations and people need to do to advance this issue uh, within, within their organization? So I'll start at the top and I'll kind of work my way on down. Um, I'm going to start with senior leadership. And so one of the key things that senior leaders can do is all of this data, all of these reports, all these meetings you're sitting in, really focus on developing that middle management because the middle management is what is affecting your turnover. It's affecting each individual employee and how they feel, that feeling of belonging, that feeling of equity, who gets promoted, who gets let go. So really develop them, help them to understand the importance of this. Why doing this? Why really focusing on them developing that empathy, developing this equitable team, right? Because I always think about this as equity, right? I don't rest until everyone on, in the organization is treated equitably, is paid equitably, and we all have equity. So how do you do that? You have to work with those frontline managers. And then to every Black woman that is listening to me today, on the first day of February, the month of love and history is what I call it, I want to tell you that you are worthy, that everything that you're doing, all of that you feel you're carrying on your shoulders, just know that you're not alone. Just know that if the organization that you're in right now doesn't see you, doesn't hear you, isn't appreciative of you, there are organizations out there that are. And I want you to show up as your authentic self, be the same person you are at home, bring that person to work. And as you continue to develop in your career, you will achieve those goals that you want to achieve, but keep being you. I, I love the, the keep being you advice. That is, that is so awesome. If, if Wesleyan, if you and I ever meet in, in, in person, I'm going to give you a big old hug. So that's great <laughs> stuff. So sorry. So Sir Therese, um, I, uh, I want to have uh, your input on uh, on what are the, some of the key takeaways that uh, that people need to be thinking about in advancing this forward. Yeah, the first thing I want to start with is just, you know, not everybody's coming at this from the same place. Some people are still figuring out, you know, should we even be having this conversation? And I want to remind you that the answer is yes. Uh, like I said, I love data. So I did come in with some stats I want to share. Um, McKinsey does their lean in report and they look into women ex women's experience and they found a lot around black women in this last year, 2022. Um, black women leaders are more ambitious than other women at their level coming in at 59%. Um, they wanting to be top executives compared to 49% of women leaders overall, right? But they're running into issues to get there. Compared to other women at their level, Black women leaders are more likely to have colleagues questioning their competence, to be subjected to demeaning behavior. Uh, and one in three Black women leaders said they've been denied or passed over for opportunities because of personal characteristics, including their race and gender. Now, I had some others, but I know we're tight on time, so I'm not going to get into it. But the point is, there is data out there already telling you at an overall level how women are Black women are experiencing the workforce. But more importantly, like we said, get your own data, find out where your black women are, and then use that to drive your actions. And some of that data may be a big push. It may be at an overall level, but data doesn't have to be hard. It doesn't have to be complex. It can be as simple as pulling someone to the side and having a conversation with them. That's data. And so, like I said, that building one-on-one -on -one relationships, there's so much power in that. That's the best way to help someone is to get to know that person. And the more people build those one-on-one -on -one relationships, we're gradually going to move everyone into the positions they want to be in. And then we have that large impact, right? So it may feel small taking one person out for a coffee, but all of that really can stack up. The uh, I, I love how you brought out the uh, McKinsey data, Sertrice, because yeah. uh, the point that you, you you pulled out about personality being cited as a reason for being passed over, that is something that's really unique uh, that women deal with in general, because I think, uh, it, it, and, and correct me if I'm wrong or some, nobody yell at me if I get this data point wrong, but oftentimes in, in performance reviews, 
something to the effect of 80% of women have some sort of critique on their personality that shows up in their performance reviews, which has absolutely nothing to do with the actual performance. So Leslie Vanetz has the exact data. So find her on LinkedIn, but she, she was the one that cited that. So that's a great data point on the, on the personality aspect coming into these decisions when it really shouldn't. Whitney, I want to uh, get your, uh, uh, oh, actually, uh, lost track of something really quickly. So before we wind down, I want to make sure everybody uh, can share with the audience and those who will be watching this remotely, where can people find you? Sir Therese, uh, we'll keep it with you. Where can people find you and what's the best way to get in touch with you? Yeah, my name is up there. I'm the only Sir Therese I know of in the world. So you pop my name into anything and I show up. So you can connect with me on LinkedIn, love keeping in touch, or you can find me on at Therese on Instagram and I post some stuff there too. Instagram's only for food pics. <laughs> uh, Whitney, where can people find you? Yes. Um, so I am on LinkedIn. Feel free to reach out. Whitney Goins. I do need to update um, my current role. Um, I'm like four weeks into a, a new role. Um, but yes, feel free to reach out and connect there. And then also, because I, I was not doing that quote justice, I did find the quote. So I did want to share if black women were free, it would mean that everyone else would have to be free since our freedom would necessitate the destruction of all systems of oppression. Um, so yes, I thank you, Wesleyan, for giving us the, the words of encouragement and affirmation, but wanted to leave people with that as well. Um, and just know that you're not alone to all the black women that are listening today on the first day of Black History Month. Thanks for joining us, Whit uh, Whitney. Wesleyan, where can people find you? Make sure you drop um, the podcast too. Oh, oh yeah. Thank you. <laughs> I always forget my podcast. So I'm just Wesleyan on LinkedIn. I have a, a podcast and I post daily sales, leadership, family life, all things amazing. So follow me, reach out if you want to chat. I appreciate uh, it. It's been a great conversation. The chat has been really active with a lot of feedback. So I appreciate all three of you hanging out with me and, you know, dealing with my shenanigans while we advance this conversation. So I appreciate your insights. For those who have uh, joined us on the stream, you can always find us uh, Wednesdays on Talent Strategy 60. If you want to get a hold of me, you can find me through Circa or you can find me basically everywhere except Instagram. So uh, definitely reach out. If you're dealing with, uh, with any issues from a talent strategy perspective, make sure we're connecting. And hopefully we have helped you uh, do more with less in advancing your talent strategy by hanging out with us and hearing the voices of these great leaders. So thanks for joining us and tune in next time for another great uh, Talent Strategy 60 show.